Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I am Sharada Srinivasan. I'm at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the University of Guelph. I'm currently the director of the Canada India Research Center for Learning and Engagement, Circle for short. Circle was uh, established in uh, February this year, and it aims to be an interdisciplinary uh, gateway uh, for cutting edge research uh, related to India and the Indian diaspora uh, in Canada. Um, today we have a very exciting uh, session, the first of um, the series uh, for this term, the fall term. Uh, we have um, a distinguished panel uh, discussing Karin Gagne's uh, book, Caring for uh, Glaciers. So without um, uh, any further delay, I'm going to hand it over to Karin Gagne, the author of the book, uh, Caring for Glaciers, to speak a little bit about the book and introduce the panelists. Over to you, Karin. Thank you, Sherida. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, so um, I would like to start by thanking my colleague, Sharada Srinivasan, and uh, the circle at the University of Guelph, uh, the Canadian Research Center for Learning and Engagement, um, for organizing this event. Um, so we were all supposed to meet in Guelph in last April, but I think we all know why this uh, event was canceled. Uh, <laughs> So even though this is taking place now online, uh, it doesn't mean that there is no work behind the organization of something like that. So thank you uh, again, Sharada. Um, I'm reversing a little bit the order on what I had on my note, but I want to first introduce our four panelists. Um, I am in depth, uh, who would dare asking people for extra work at this time of the year. I did. <laughs> and all of our panelists graciously accepted the invitation to reconvene uh, this book panel. Um, so time is such a scarce resource, so I want to um, recognize this while thanking you uh, for being here. Uh, on that, before saying a few words on the book, I would uh, like to introduce um, our four panelists. So Tanya Richardson here is an associate professor in the Anthropology and Global Studies programs at the Wilfrid Laurier University. She has carried out research about the impact of the creation of a biosphere reserve on landscapes and livelihoods in um, the Ukrainian part of the Danube Delta. Her current research is about the conservation of an Aboriginal honeybee population in uh, Ukraine's Carpathian Mountains. She is the author of Kaleidoscopic Odisha, uh, History and Place in Contemporary Ukraine. Ukraine, I'm sorry. Sarah Schneiderman uh, serves as Associate Professor at the Department of Anthropology in the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at the University of British Columbia. Um, she is a social cultural anthropologist with long-term ethnographic commitments in the Himalayas and South Asia. Her research explores how social transformation is shaped by dynamics of citizenship and belonging in relation to indigenous, ethnic, religious, and gender identities, cross-border mobility, conflict and political mobilization, territory and land use, development discourses and practices, and disaster aftermath and preparedness. Her first book is titled Rituals of Ethnicity, Tongmi's Identities Between Nepal and India, and she is the co-editor of the book Darjeeling Reconsidered Histories, Politics, Environment. Travis Stephan is assistant professor at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the University of Guelph. Travis is an evolutionary anthropologist and his research program investigate human lemur interaction within a shared environment. Travis leverages conservation, biogeography, spatial ecology, and one health approaches to understand how lemurs interact with and respond to human caused disturbance. He also looks at how um, humans are impacted by applied conservation measures targeting lemurs and their habitat. Travis is also founding director of Planet Madagascar, a nonprofit focused on helping to create sustainable forest communities in Madagascar. David Boris, Boris is a PhD candidate in public health and international 
professional development at the Department of Population Medicine at the University of Guelph. David is a research-based videographer and photographer who unites an interest in research for transformative social and environmental change with a passion for visual media. He has worked with communities in multiple countries to co-produce uh, visual outputs related to human environment relationships. He is currently working in partnership with Inuit from Labrador to co-create a research-based documentary film about the connection between caribou and Inuit knowledge. So again, I wanna say thank you all for being here, here today. Sorry, I've presented you before doing my little introduction on the book. I can't reverse the order of what is on my sheet. I feel a bit nervous by the format. So uh, before moving to the presentations, I uh, will take a few minutes to say a few words on Vladak so and, and uh, the book. So to better describe caring for glaciers as a book, I should perhaps start with uh, a question. Why are glaciers receding? The scientific outlook on glaciers is generally turned towards the global. So there is no exact science to assess the recession of the glaciers of the Himalayas and the rhythm at which they are doing so. But the notion that the recession of glaciers is an outcome of something which is taking place on the global scene, anthropogenic climate change, is uh, generally accepted. Caring for glaciers is a journey, if I can put it this way, uh, into why gla glaciers are receding, mostly from the perspective of Ladakhi elders. And the answer is here not located at the global level. For Ladakhis, um, glaciers are receding because a certain ethics of care for the land, for the animals, and for divine beings is receding. So why is this ethics of care uh, eroding? According to elders, there is a number of reasons for that, but there is a certain beginning to this with the post-independent uh, geopolitical context of India. With the independence of India, um, the state of Ladakh as a border area has solidified at the rhythm of successive wars with Pakistan and with the war with China. Today, maintaining an ethics of care in the form that elders have known it is a challenge. The militarization of Ladakh, together with the expansion of the bureaucratic apparatus, has generated access to employment beyond the traditional agro-pastoralist activities, generally outside the villages, opening up new possibilities for Ladakhi to pursue individual aspiration. The military infrastructure in the region has grown significantly since I conducted the research which, which is at the core of this book. Every time I return to Ladakh, I can see new military buildings. I often think of this as the slow violence of the reconfiguration of Ladakh into a border area, a landscape transformed by geopolitical conflicts and an agro-pastoralist life way which is eroding. The militarization of the landscape is, however, rarely evoked as an issue by the Daki, and the book will offer insights into why it is like that. It is complex. A brief outlook at the recent events of the summer of 2020 can offer some insight into this. In June, there was a violent escalation at the line of actual control which divides India and China. 20 Indian soldiers were killed and an unknown number of Chinese soldiers perished. Then in late August, another face-off broke out with the troops. The Guardian has recently published an article titled, Villagers Help Indian Troops Face Chinese Forces in the Himalayas. Indeed, about a hundred of villagers from Shushul in Ladakh near the border have been voluntarily bringing material and food for the troops to help with the coming winter ahead. The article cites a young man, Tsering, saying, we want to help the Indian army to secure their position immediately. We are carrying supplies to them, doing multiple rounds in a day to ensure that the army doesn't face too many problems. This summer, Ladakhi living near the border were anxiously waiting to perhaps have to do the mandatory portrait work if the conflict was worsening. This at a time when COVID has not only claimed lives in Ladakh, but left many vulnerable with a tourist season that never happened, an industry that many are depending on today. They were worried. One of my friends said, a war with Pakistan is one thing, a war with China is another. 
Many experts are indeed, indeed questioning whether India is ready for not or not for that. And Ladakhi certainly feel this. Something else has been going on in Ladakh. In 2019, a few days after I left the region, the Parliament of India passed an act by which Ladakh became a union territory. Ladakh was until then part of the Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir. This means that Ladakh is now ruled directly by the Indian state. Ladakhi had for long asked for this, but not entirely in the form which this is now taking. With the creation of Ladakh as a union territory came the revocation of certain legal provisions that the state of Jammu and Kashmir had. This means that today Indian citizens from other states can purchase land or property in Ladakh. Moreover, Ladakhi has not received the provision of the sixth schedule of the constitution which makes separate arrangements for the tribal areas. Today, manifestations are multiplying as Ladakhi are seeking tribal status to preserve demography, land, environment, and their culture. Where does it leave us in terms of receding glaciers and an ethics of care? I don't want to end on a sad note, uh, although it's sometimes difficult these days to see beyond that. You may have heard of how Ladakhi are growing glaciers to cope with the impact of climate change based on techniques developed by incredible local engineers. There is more. Ladakhi are experimenting with new things to grow on their land. On their land. Some projects are focusing on the revitalization of traditional medicine. Ladakhi's resilience certainly deserves a lot of attention, all the more perhaps today. So on this, I would like uh, to introduce our first um, panelist, uh, Tanya Richardson. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Corinne, for the opportunity to speak about your wonderful book, uh, Caring for Glaciers. Writing and publishing a book in anthropology is a long, uh, emotionally, intellectually, and in Corinne's case, physically demanding process. So for that reason, the publication of an ethnography is a real event. And um, something that we should take time to celebrate. So I'm really happy to take uh, part in amplifying its messages and to help ensure that the book uh, travels to different audiences. Uh, so we'll each, of, each of us will speak about different aspects of the book. In my case, I would like to speak about it as a work of environmental anthropology and also to highlight a few aspects of Corinne's ethnographic writing. So before I do, uh, let me just give a few details about uh, where, when, and how Corinne did her field work. Uh, so Corinne did her, her research with uh, Buddhist Ladakhis in Ladakh's uh, Sham area. So this involved spending time in the town of Leh and in several villages over a 12 month period in 2013 and 2014 with trips uh, before and after that. Uh, Corinne worked very closely with a research ass assistant, uh, Nam Gyal, uh, whose uh, contribution to uh, the relationships that Corinne formed and the knowledge that she acquired is made visible throughout the book. She also makes us aware of the physical and emotional challenges of doing fieldwork in a militarized border area, a place where the roads are closed uh, in the winter, uh, where the uh, temperatures in winter reach minus 50, uh, which require one to sleep under 50 pounds of blankets, and where uh, food supplies are challenged uh, for those who don't farm. So uh, these help us feel what it is like to live in this part of the world and the strength and resilience of the people who make it their home. So I focus on the book's contributions to environmental anthropology because Corinne herself initially framed her study as being about uh, Buddhist Ladakhi's experiences of environmental change and because topics uh, such as climate change, which are central to the book, are often framed as being most centrally about something we call the environment. And as Corinne highlighted, uh, the recession of glaciers in the Himalayas is explained by many experts as being caused by planetary scale geophysical processes of anthropogenic climate change. That is, they locate the cause of change uh, outside of uh, the region. However, uh, like the best works in environmental anthropology, Corinne's book is about much more than human environment relations, as they might be understood in a conventional materialist and secularist way. That is, 
to understand how Ladakis engaged in mutually sustaining relations with glaciers, mountains, animals, fields, and pasture, and how these have been undermined, we need to pay attention to issues of cosmology, religion, ritual, state formation, war, and militarization. While Corinne's book provides us uh, with a work of environmental anthropology, it is also much to teach us about the anthropology of the state, religion, Tibetan Buddhism, pastoralism, the political economy of agrarian change. As such, it demonstrates forcefully the artificiality of such di of distinctions between politics, religion, the environment, and the economy for Ladakis and serves as another powerful reminder of how such domaining practices arise from modern Euro-American habits of thinking. Corinne effectively straddles and mutes these distinctions by drawing on the anthropology of ethics and morality, and more specifically, uh, by describing what she calls a Ladakhi ethics of care that arises out of their intimate engagement with land, animals, glaciers, and deities. She draws on writing in the anthropology of religion that takes ethics as a field of practice that is socially located and culturally informed and that people undertake with a conscious orientation towards a conception of what is good, proper, and virtuous. Following Ladakis themselves and some anthropologists, she distinguishes ethics as practice from morality as that which involves collectively held obligations and duties. It also enables her to trace the way in which these ethics, though informed by Tibetan Buddhist precepts, are formed as much, if not more, through their affective and embodied engagements with animals and the land and are for focused more on ensuring their continuity rather than transcending them. Corinne's impetus to center the anthropology of ethics and morality and to write a, an ethnography about Ladakhi ethics of care is illustrated forcefully in her introductory chapter by a story in which Abby Lobsong, a resident of Ang, explains why her community is facing water scarcity. Although Abby Lobsong begins her commentary by referencing a warming climate, she quickly moves on to explain that the problem is more likely stems from the fact that villagers are no longer performing the ritual of taking coal from each household to the mountains to grow the new glacier called Kangri Soma. And why not, asks Karin, to which Abby Lobsong answers that Ladakis are now empty of heart. It was conversations such as these, along with comments that Ladakis had become careless, sana metkan, in their relations with glaciers and the deities who reside there, that inspired Corinne to write about an ethics of care, rather than Bruno Latour, Donna Haraway, or other feminist scholars who use this term. Providing an ethnographic account of Ladakhi ethics and morality enables Corinne to unfold Ladakhi explanations for why they have become careless and empty of heart, that demonstrate how seemingly secular political events have cosmological consequences. For example, Corinne found that her questions about the causes of environmental change produced accounts about the India-Pakistan uh, War, which they referred to with the term Arthalis, or Hindi for 48, the year Ladakhis in Sham experienced it. This leads to her trek across Sham to speak with elders about these events many of whom witnessed the massacre of fellow, fellow villagers, Pakistani raiders, and animals. In chapter two, which is called Arthalus and Beyond, A Crack in the Landscape, Corinne describes the distress caused by witnessing and participating in such acts of violence, which violate the Buddhist, Buddhist ethical precepts that Ladakhis follow. These acts of violence, both committed and witnessed, fundamentally changed people, elders say, and Ladakhi's immoral acts may have led to karmic retribution, now evident in the form of deteriorating environmental conditions. This was a critical event, Corinne writes, referencing Vina Das, that is, one that overturned the existing order, annihilated previous modes of thinking, and created new ways of being in the world. On the one hand, attention to ethics and morality helps Corinne unpack Ladakhi accounts of the origin of environmental change in political events. On the other, it helps connect the past to the present in the way that the changing political economy of the region and Ladakhi's engagement with it is making it harder and harder for them to fulfill their moral obligations to provide labor for farming. 
This is because many have moved away to towns to work or to serve in the military as their vision of the good life has changed. In Sham, successful farming requires that all people contribute their labor and that prayers and rituals involving the monastic community are performed to ensure that deities such as Sadak, the Lord of the Soil, Yulha, the God of the Mountain, um, Lu, the God of the Underworld, and Jidak, the owner of the land, cooperate. Karim describes how the performance of rituals has been shortened and curtailed because those who return to provide labor cannot stay long enough for the full rituals to be performed. These issues were discussed in chapter four called Father White Glacier, Incommensurable Temporalities and Eroding Filial Bonds. It is one of my favorite chapters because it illustrates the tension between different generations, ways of practicing Buddhist ethics, the consequences of these for the discontinuation of a ritual and the challenges of trying to revive this ritual. The chapter is therefore uh, very much about what an ethics of caring for land actually is and why it is so hard to maintain it in the present. Like other chapters, Corinne's ethnographic narrative allows the reader to learn and to be surprised alongside her as she helps plant crops, worries about water, converses with elders, finds out about the discontinued skin yug ritual, and tra traverses the land in search of knowledge holders who might perform it. So I would like to recount a little bit of Corinne's narrative for you. Corinne learned about the Skin Yu ritual from Elder Nawang Gelson in the village Ting Mo Sang when discussing the threat of water scarcity and the fact that Tibetan winter almanacs predicted no rainfall anytime soon. He began by insisting that glaciers were not receding because of climate change, one of the few people Corinne heard use the term, but because villagers were not caring for the mountain deity and the underworld deity. Deities, like people, have personalities, and the owner of the land in Ting Mo Sang, according to Na Wang Gyaltsen, is stubborn and refuses to let villagers farm unless they pay the right tribute. The right tribute is the skin yug ritual, which is no longer performed, but which some elders hope to revive. Disappointed that young people have no interest in this type of activity, Na Wang Gyaltsen asked, but how can old folks like us climb this mountain? When Corinne then tries to find out from another villager about whether the ritual will be organized, no one seems to know, so she sets off to the local monastery. However, the resident monk knows nothing about it, not only because he's only recently arrived, but also because he was trained in a more orthodox Buddhism that rejects rituals like skin yu as heretical. Seeing Corinne's disappointment, another villager recommends that she visit grandfather Nyama, who had once been a monk at Ting Mo Sang's monastery, but was living in another monastery 40 kilometers away. This time, Corinne is in luck. Grandfather Nyama describes the ritual in detail, which requires the participation of monks, musicians, children, and lay people, all of whom should climb the steep mountain at the upper part of the Ting Mo Sang village. The ritual was performed on the summit, which allows a full view of the village's main glacier, which is the abode of the land god. The worshippers appeal to him by shouting, Father White Glacier, Juhei, Mother Mapam Lake, Juhei, Jidak of the village, sacred owner of the land, Juhei. Corinne explains that this resembles a ritual performed during wedding ceremonies. The community is like the bride leaving her birth community and saluting her father and mother. In doing so, villagers affirm their affiliation with the glacier and a lake. And here I quote Corinne, because they are sources of fresh water, life's most fundamental resource, the glacier and the lake symbolize a father and a mother who take care of their children. Through the ritual, villagers acknowledge that they live under the patronage of the local land god without whom they would be at a loss. In the end, however, the Skinju ritual was not performed. Grandfather Niyama has no successor. There are no people who would pay for the ritual, or few people. Udaki's filial links with Glacier have been eroded, and with them, what Corinne calls landscape kinship, a mode of dwelling sustained by moral obligations between people, land, and glaciers. So just a couple of words to finish. I dwelt here in, on the particulars of Corinne's ethnography because her careful storytelling and descriptions show us how a Ladakhi ethics of care 
can speak to and against global narratives about climate change and the charismatic mega concept of the Anthropocene, which is moving to the forefront of environmental scholarship in anthropology and in other disciplines. What I like about Corinne's book is the way it stays close to Ladakhi practices and thought. Her use of the Anthropocene and climate change make very brief appearances at the beginning and the end of the book. This means that we are able to see that while Ladakhis and Anthropocene scholars share a sense that humans have caused the change, they differ dramatically in their understanding of how and why this change occurred and what actions need to be taken to reverse it. Like all good ethnographies, Corinne and the people she writes about, Abi Lobsang, Na Wang Yeltsin, father, uh, grandfather Niema, show us ways of being and knowing and relating that can open up and enrich uh, metropolitan environmental scholars' understanding of a changing world. And I hope they take the time to read this book. So thank you. Thank you, Tanya. That's very generous. And uh, now I would like to welcome, please, uh, Sarah Schneiderman. Great. <clears throat> Sorry. Great. Thank you very much. Let me just take a sip of water. <clears throat> it's early morning here in Vancouver, um, so I'm sorry. The coffee is still doing its work. Um, thank you, Karine, for having me here as part of this panel and to colleagues at Circle and Guelph in general. I had wished I could join you in person. It would have been my first trip to Guelph, um, but perhaps we'll be able to do that at some future date. Um, and thank you, uh, Tanya, for uh, laying out uh, some of those ethnographic details so um, beautifully. Um, that really helps me uh, make some of the points that I want to make as well. Before going further, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you um, from Vancouver, British Columbia, um, which perhaps should instead be known as the unceded ancestral territory of the Hunkaminam speaking Musqueam people. Um, and I say that in part because it's an important part of our practice here uh, to recognize whose land it is um, on which we are privileged to live and work, um, but also because I think it resonates very strongly with the themes of the book that we're here to discuss today. And that's something that I would like to come back to a bit later in my comments, um, although the um, book is not framed around concepts of indigeneity, and there are many good reasons for that, uh, given the particular valences of that concept in South Asia. I think that many of the ways in which Karine describes uh, relationships with land have a lot of resonance um, with some of the uh, concepts and ways of thinking about these issues here in Canada. Um, and I think that might be an interesting uh, comparative discussion uh, for us to consider. So I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. Before I do that, <clears throat> let me introduce myself and situate my own work in the Himalayan region. Um, for over 25 years, I've worked in Nepal and Northeast India, um, in Nepal, primarily in the regions of um, Mustang and Dolaka, and in India, in Darjeeling and Sikkim. And I just wanted to share a map of the Himalayan region with you here um, to give you some sense of the full span of what we're talking about here. Um, <clears throat> sorry, let me share that with you. Um, can you see my screen now? Great, thank you. Um, so you'll see, this is a terrain map just from Google Maps, and you can see in the upper left-hand corner, um, Leh, which is the um, major city in Ladakh about which Kareen writes in her book. Uh, and then much further east here is the um, region of Mustang in Nepal, a former Himalayan kingdom, uh, now part of the nation state of Nepal. And then here is uh, the district of Dolaka, Further east is Sikkim and Darjeeling. And these are the regions in which I've spent my time as an anthropologist over the last 25 years. But I wanted to show you the map to suggest the forms of connectivity that exist across the full range of the Himalayan region here. Um, and I'm echoing our colleague, Pasanyangji Sherpa, uh, who makes the point in her, her book review of um, Karine's book in the Journal of Asian Studies that although the ethnographic material that Karine so gracefully and poignantly shares is particular to Ladakh, uh, many of the themes that are raised are really pan-Himalayan. Uh, and that's in terms of both the transformation of the environment, the transformation of social relations, and the transformation of um, political experiences. So as I was reading the book, 
almost on every page, I would stop and just say, yes, that is so true. I really feel uh, what is being communicated here. I feel it in the voices of the elders and it connects very strongly uh, to the community members with whom I've worked over such a long time as well even though the people with whom I work reside in a very different political space. And that brings me to um, the next point I want to make here. And let's see if we can shift uh, to the political view uh, on Google Map. You'll see that what appeared as an interconnected mountain range across this region uh, is in fact subdivided by national borders uh, between Nepal, India, Bhutan, and then of course in the contested area, uh, which forms the uh, subject matter of this book uh, between India, Pakistan, and China. Um, so it's that crisscrossing of uh, political boundaries on territorial space, which in the environmental sense knows no boundary, uh, which is really the crux of the matter uh, in terms of the experiences of um, many of um, Kareem's interlocutors that we meet here. So I'll just stop sharing that now. Um, so I visited Ladakh only once actually in 1995, 25 years ago now, at uh, the beginning of my time working in the Himalayas. I've never returned, um, but even then I could see both the similarities and contrasts with the Himalayan regions that I was more familiar with further east, which I just showed you. The main uh, thing that I noticed at that time were the roads. And the roads figure prominently in many of the ethnographic descriptions in this book. Um, what Kareem draws out so beautifully is the fact that these are spaces in Ladakh which are on the one hand uh, in the high mountains and could be seen as remote, yet on the other hand are very deeply interconnected with the body of the nation state and then of course more broadly uh, with global networks through that network of roads. And at that time when I had first um, visited the area in the mid-1990s, that was simply not the case throughout most of Himalaya and Nepal. That's now transformed radically as well. And there are, there are uh, there's a, a huge influx of road building uh, across the Himalayan regions of Nepal as well. But the point I want to make here is that that form of connectivity had come much earlier uh, to Ladakh than to many other Himalayan regions. This, I think, is primarily a feature of Ladakh's importance as a border region, um, which brings me to the first major point that I'd like to make as I try to situate caring for glaciers within the larger frameworks of Himalayan anthropology, as well as South Asian studies. In the book, uh, Karin portrays Ladakhis as both fully political and fully environmental subjects entangled with historical and natural transformations at local, national, and global scales. This multidimensional approach makes caring for glaciers a critical departure from many earlier works about this region, as well as other parts of the Himalayas, which tend to take either, uh, sorry, which tend to take an either or approach, either historical and political or uh, environmental. And that has been a, a kind of um, uh, a critical uh, challenge, I think, in conceptualizing this region, how to bring these two frameworks together. And that's something uh, that I think this book does in just a remarkable way, which really shows the way forward. Residents of high Himalayan regions like Ladakh or Mustang in Nepal, which is where I did my own first ethnographic research uh, in the mid 1990s, were often represented earlier as quote unquote mountain people, uh, living their own ecologically attuned lives apart from the ravages of the national political experiences that shape the states in which they happen to be situated, whether that be India, Nepal, or China. This is a tendency that I have argued against in my own work, simply because people maintained agrarian livelihoods in high mountain terrain does not mean that they were not also engaged with the state or in many cases, such as the one that Kareen describes, multiple states at the same time. This book demonstrates such entanglement beautifully through the historical ethnography of Ladakh's experience of partition uh, and the ongoing militarization of the region as a sensitive border space contested between India, Pakistan, and China, uh, not to mention uh, the ongoing uh, Kashmiri freedom struggle as well. 
This geopolitical positionality is as relevant now as ever with heightening border tensions in this very region over the last several months, which Karine also alluded to in her opening remarks. Just yesterday, I read a piece in the diplomat.com um, online uh, forum titled, quote, the India-China Ladakh crisis, why so silent world? Um, and I thought that that title was very telling um, because the question that it asks comes back to this issue of flattened representations of mountain communities as somehow outside of political time. And that is what this book does so much work um, towards correcting. In so doing, Karine further argues that the transformation of agro-pastoral livelihoods and the loss of filial relations with the mountain deities that make up the land, glaciers and otherwise, is neither a result of mountain dwellers' own insufficiencies or lack of knowledge. And yes, this is the very demeaning argument that scholars who advanced the once popular theory of Himalayan degradation made in the 1980s, uh, the notion that Himalayan people simply didn't know enough about the impact of their actions on the land, and that's what was leading to deforestation and erosion. So um, in Karine's view, this is very clearly not uh, the case or the, the driving uh, the, the main driving factor uh, behind environmental transformation, um, nor is it the unfortunate but unavoidable collateral damage of mountain dwellers in complete integration into global capitalism due to their impossibly remote location. Rather, she argues that the uh, rapid rate of environmental transformation is largely the result of nationalist developmentalism that has required people to step aside from their own land in order to make space for the military uh, that's required to secure international borders. Seen in this light, the sense of deep loneliness that the elders portrayed in this book uh, hold is not only poignant, but really unforgivable. Their children and grandchildren have been told that in order to be successful citizens of the Indian nation state, they must go elsewhere to Punjab, uh, Delhi, and beyond. But this is not because the land on which they were born is worthless, rather precisely the opposite. It is so valuable within the national imaginary and within the national strategic repertoire that its own inhabitants must be evacuated to make way for the state. And this is where I want to come back to the uh, resonance with our uh, current discussions here in Canada um, at a moment that uh, we might conceptualize of reconciliation uh, about the relationship between the state and its people, uh, particularly its people who are the inhabitants of territories which are seen as valuable uh, for expansion of state purposes. And um, I think that's very much the scenario that we encounter um, in Korean's book in terms of uh, the kind of diminishing capacity for Ladakhis themselves to determine their own futures in relation to the land. Um, and I think that is also the experience of uh, many indigenous peoples here in Canada over time. And therefore, uh, there's a real need to think through what it means to um, critique this sort of state expansionism um, in a place like India in relation to uh, the kind of knowledge holders in its own territory and what it means to do to make similar kinds of critiques here, for instance. And I think that um, that would be a conversation worth pursuing. Um, there's also some mention in the book about the uh, educational migration, which is common throughout the Himalayas, where people, uh, young people leave their home in order to um, be educated either in lay or, of course, much farther afield in the places that I've already mentioned. And I think at some point, um, I didn't know the page number, Karin, you actually use the word term residential school um, for this kind of experience. And I've also often heard that used in the South Asian context. And it's interesting because there it still holds a very positive valence, I think, in many local people's minds. Um, the idea that my child is going to go to boarding school and receive an education, they're going to become, uh, in a sense, cultivated as a citizen of the nation state. Um, but of course, that term here, um, residential school, has come to take on a very different meaning. Um, and I think it would be interesting to think through uh, some of those differences in perception and how they work and why. So um, 
With the departure of young people from the land, it is only the elders who are left remembering what once was in Ladakh and using their limited physical and financial resources to maintain individual relations with territory in its embodied form, uh, rather than the communal forms of relationship uh, that once were uh, prevalent. And that comes back to what Tanya was saying about the rituals um, invoking mountain deities and so forth, and the sense of challenge that um, Ladakhis uh, currently hold in terms of how to actually mobilize the communal resources um, to bring those rituals about. Uh, but I think it's very clear in the book that those individual relationships remain, but they're in a sense a skeletal form of what used to be a more fulsome um, social structure. It's the deeply situated knowledge through which such relations between individuals, communities, and the land must be maintained that sing out from every page in this book. Rather than portraying these elders as somehow locked in traditional ways of life, uh, unable to understand science or modernity, Kareen succeeds in showing how they in fact hold the most relevant knowledge for the place that they are in. And I think that's really critical. It's in this sense that relationships with glaciers are the barometer for morality, as it's so beautifully put in the book. Uh, appropriately situated knowledge is ethical knowledge in the deepest sense. And for me, that argument uh, about the power of situated knowledge is just so important. This leads to the final point um, that I want to make. Uh, Korean situates her interlocutors as deeply ethical actors in the Buddhist sense, but not because they are following a rigid textualized notion of what Buddhist ethics in a formal sense looks like. Rather, they are embodying the principles of right action in their everyday relationality with the full range of beings that they encounter, human and non-human, exemplifying interconnectedness through their lived reality. This begs the question of how they themselves theorize the relationship between knowledge and action, and how such a framework might be a valuable model, not only for their own community and its younger generations, but for people all over the world who seek to live life as both fully political and fully environmental subjects wherever we are. This seems to be one of the critical challenges facing us today, how to do that. And caring for glaciers provides some ways to think forward by bringing us into the world of deeply situated knowledge and action that the elders of Ladakh hold. And so I just wanted to conclude um, by reading a quotation from the book review of uh, Caring for Glaciers in the Journal of Asian Studies uh, written by our colleague Pasang Yangji Sherpa, who articulates this um, very beautifully. Um, she herself comes from a Sherpa community in northeastern Nepal um, and really makes the case that I've just uh, tried to make here as well, uh, that this book has global importance. And I think um, I really strongly agree with that. So um, Pasang writes, as a result, the Himalayas can no longer be seen simply as a geological massif. Gagné demonstrates that the region becomes meaningful through the entanglements of land, animals, and humans. In caring for glaciers, readers learn that the ethics of care, which maintain these entanglements, are eroding. It is therefore a sobering gift. And that's the end of the quote. Um, I very much share that feeling and would like to thank you deeply, Corrine, for sharing that gift with us. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for this. Um, uh, yes, many things to think about here. Um, on that, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Travis Stephens. I'm sorry, maybe it was introduced, but I my connection is terrible. So if my signal it drops, uh, my apologies, but I'll just hop back on. Uh, that was a fantastic overview by, I'm assuming that it's my time to go. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, the uh, I didn't hear because my connection dropped, but the, uh, that was a fantastic overview uh, of the book from from Tanya and Sarah. The the uh, framing this in an anthropological context, um, 
and with other perspectives in anthropology, but also situating the book in the broader context of the Himalayas and Kanda um, is really fascinating for me. I, I actually come at this book from a very different perspective. I'm a, I'm a lemur researcher um, and I work in Madagascar. Now the connections to India are clear because 90 million years ago, India and Madagascar were once attached. So there's definitely some similarity um, and, uh, and obviously many differences. And reading this as a, as a primate researcher first, who, who looks at the interaction of primates with their environment and people, um, and then also who's interested in applied conservation and looking at how um, people are, are, are coping with conservation activities who live in a shared environment with lemurs, I felt this book was extremely compelling. Um, uh, I, even outside of just a traditional, of anthropo from anthropological perspectives, I was thinking of it even just from someone who's a lemur researcher who's trying to understand the relationship between animals and the environment and the relationship between peoples and those animals and their environment. What I loved about what Karen did is she would give personal reflections on every concept uh, that helped me as also a field worker engage with the landscape she was describing. And it helped me understand how people there would conceive their landscape and how they situated themselves there and how they situated themselves within a broader context of that, the world that they lived in. I also loved, and this was touched upon by both Tanya and Sarah, is about how we got a sense of the change in those perspectives and ideas through history and time. And this is something that, that very much relates to what I see in Madagascar. You know, I don't study people in Madagascar. I typically study lemurs for the most part. Um, but I, I've lived with people in, in remote places in Madagascar and I've come to understand them, you know, as a, as a, you know, as a, uh, as colleagues, as friends, um, as people who work together towards similar goals. And I noticed many parallels in caring for glaciers that I see when I discuss and, and, um, and meet with people in Madagascar, uh, say over tea or over fire. Um, and one of the main things I really found fascinating was how animals are very, they're, they're perceived in very different ways in different places. Uh, I, I think I should probably just share my screen because it's worthwhile showing. I'm gonna see if I can do that. Hopefully this works out for the best. I just wanted to give an example about how people perceive. I, I hope everyone can see it. Can I get a thumbs up? Yeah, great, I got this. This is, uh, this is an injury. This is a lemur. Uh, and they call it babakutu. Babakutu means the, the ancestor of people in Madagascar. There's a fantastic story of how this lemur, who's one of the furthest jumping animals in the world, can leap from tree to tree, um, uh, crossing gaps of up to 10 meters, uh, bouncing majestically through the forest, uh, one day discovered a young boy who was trapped up in a tree because the vines he had crawled up had been cut by some uh, by a villager who needed the vines for for growing uh, for for building material. Well, Baba Kutu was worried about this child, put the child on his back and flew through the forest to bring him to the safety of the village. When they brought the when he brought down this child, the, the villagers were quite happy that their ancestors were still looking out for them. Now, in this country, there's over 100 different lemur species. So the relationship to animals isn't uniform. This next species here is called an eye eye. If you've ever seen one, it's probably the most outrageous creature on the planet. And they have these ridiculous fingers, which you can see in the bottom. It's a, a middle finger with a, with a ball joint. The same people that regard and revere Babakutu consider this animal to be evil. And so the spirit, if this animal is seen in a community or a village, um, there's different approaches, but some will feel that the village itself has now been tainted and they will evacuate the village, sometimes permanently. In some cases, they feel seeing the, 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 uh, the uh, species will bring, will bring um, uh, bad fortune or death. So the only way to overcome that would be to kill it. So I found that when you read Karen's book, you see there are many similarities between how, in, in some ways in Madagascar and how that relationship to animals is not simple. It's, it's more than just um, a, a one way of viewing animals. And, and obviously there, the, many of the differences is this born out of some uh, of Buddhist ideologies where in Madagascar, they have their own animistic versions 
of, of their own religion that has been uh, strongly influenced by Catholicism. Um, but that is another parallel that I found reading the book. You know, there's a historical context for, for how people perceive animals and how they live their lives. And then I really enjoyed looking at how landscapes in in, in Ladakh were conceived versus say landscapes in Madagascar. So I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen because we would imagine Madagascar is well, quite forested and that's what often people perceive, but it's actually suffers from a severe amount of deforestation. And we would perceive this landscape as one thing, we would see it as, as, as oh, the destruction of forest. But many people in Madagascar would see this as opportunity for grazing cattle. Um, where this was once forest, this is now uh, a place that they can bring cattle and to them cattle are very important as a source of wealth. Um, and so this is where uh, a, a conflict occurs between conservation and, and, and local interests of, and, and concepts of their landscape. Now on the flip side, the same people that would see this as important also agree about the importance of forest to those same cattle because forest provides shade, provides access to water. And so it's not, an, it's not a, a dichotomy. It's, it's built on a continuum that is, uh, is something that's difficult when you're doing a science to try to understand because if you're looking at it from a scientific perspective, it's not, it's not clean and it's not clear. And that was something that I, that I've, I, I heard in, in, Karen's, in Corinne's book is that the, these these situations that we see in these landscapes are not simple. Oh, my apologies, I clicked the wrong button. Um, and these landscapes that what, what we see is now deforested and empty are actually potentially beneficial. However, there's repercussions to this changes as, as this erosion that we start seeing occurring on this landscape continues. It creates a situation that's a new type of landscape that is now has different uh, perceptions by people in these communities because now you cannot graze your cattle here. The forest is not providing watershed or shade. And this is the repercussions of converting forest to, um, to usable habitat for cattle. So there's, there's a, there's a continuum that even people recognize that when they go too far themselves, they know they need to pull back on how they engage with their environment because they know the environment engages with them. And so they're, they're very attuned with it. Uh, and so reading Corinne's book, just from almost as a, uh, of an, a person who's concerned about conservation, I realized this, excuse me, stopping the share, this, it helped really situate for me that some of these ideas that uh, I don't see the screen anymore. Okay, I think it's good. Um, are in some ways common between two very disparate types of climates and, and places and geopolitical contexts, but in some cases completely different. Uh, I had some notes uh, that I've lost track of, but the, the ways of, for example, bringing ceremonies back to bring back rain and to improve weather is something that a lot of community members that I speak with talk about when I, when I ask them about what, what type of conservation measures should we bring to your community? What type of conservation measures are you interested in bringing to, um, to projects that we're working with you on? And often there's a commonality in the interests and but the, what's a, what it also I find encouraging is that in the past, they were very concerned about how forest operated and how forest existed. And they, you would use ceremony to work with that. But as things have changed, as economies have become more cash driven, as people have moved to the cities, these are all things that happen in, in Ladakh as well there's been a, a distance of people losing connection to those ceremonies that used to used to root them in their landscape. And so there's a plea by many of the older people in the communities to bring back these ceremonies. And they may see that as the reason why the forest is not healthy anymore and that the landscapes are eroding. But, and, and that may not be obviously the, the, we would consider the scientific reason for the erosion in that landscape. But they are connected, and I think it's important to acknowledge those people, which Corinne's book does uh, in dramatically. And I was very, I was very interested to hear about how the the similarities occurred in this these, these groups in, in what are completely different places, um, although the differences were fascinating as well. 
regarding the people, I found it quite um, almost humorous when I was reading about how the Ladakis would consider themselves like sentinels of their of their landscape, but how the British didn't perceive them this way. And yet they perceived other groups like the, um, um, in Tibet, the, uh, it'll come to me in a moment, but Corinne mentions it. And there's a similar pattern in, in Madagascar where the, the tribe that I work with are very proud of the fact that they were the last tribe to fall to, to in, a, in a great war that occurred amongst the 18 tribes. And they consider that very important. And to them, this, this, the value they place on themselves is, and this landscape is they're tough. They're able to handle this landscape. And when this invading uh, group came, they couldn't handle the landscape like they could. And so they, they were able to resist much longer than, than other groups around the area. And I found that an interesting similarity to how Ladakis perceive themselves with regards to their ability to tolerate their, 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 um, their, the, the elevation in their environment that they live in. Um, although it's the opposite situation where I work, it's plus 45 and, and, uh, and, uh, and no rain, as opposed to minus 45 and, uh, and high elevation, this much lower elevation. Um, and I think those that aren't, are looking to understand, especially if you're looking to do conservation from the animal side of, of conservation, you must situate how people are involved. It, there's, it's, a, it, it's, it's unquestionable that people are important to the equation of conservation. And I'd once given a presentation at a conference where the keynote speaker said, we have to wrestle conservation away from social scientists and bring it back to ecologists. To which I thought, what are the, that must be the craziest idea in the world because although we can understand all we want about the biogeography of where lemurs are and how they're impacted by humans, without understanding why humans are impacting them and how they perceive the impacts to lemurs, we're not gonna be able to solve any of the problems. And it's obviously something where we need to work um, in direct connection to the people who live in direct connection to the wildlife and the landscapes that we're interested in, in protecting. So I thank Karen for giving me a perspective about that that I found fascinating. And I've, uh, I keep the book up here with my lemurs to, to try to um, get them to, to remind themselves that other animals are considered in various ways around the world. And, uh, and that uh, I think this is a, for anyone that's interested in how people relate to their landscape, this would be a book to read. Thank you very much, Karen, Corinne. Thank you, Travis, again uh, for this and then for the many interesting uh, parallels between two very different places. I think I will come back to this uh, later on. So on this, I would like to introduce uh, David Boris, um, who's going to speak a bit about his own experience uh, as it relates to um, human and animal relationship. Great. So uh, yeah, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, Maybe you can give me a thumbs up if you can see walking caribou. Okay, great. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, having me on this discussion. Uh, thank you to all the other speakers for all of your insights. And thank you to Kareen for uh, putting out this very important piece of work. Um, I think similar to Travis, I'm coming at this discussion from a very different perspective. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a project called HERD, Inuit Voices on Caribou. Uh, which talks about the relationships between Inuit well-being and caribou in Labrador, so northeastern Canada. And obviously caribou, Inuit, Labrador, it's a very different contextual background to the people, the glaciers of Ladakh. But while reading this book, I couldn't help but notice some of the fundamental similarities in some of these uh, concepts around human environment relationships and notions of care and responsibility all in the context of social and environmental change. And so I hope that in the next few minutes, you'll be able to see how some of these overarching ideas that Karine talks about in her book are uh, really, uh, they really resonate with different communities, lived experiences, including here in Canada. 
So uh, before I start, I'd just like to mention that this project is uh, led by a steering committee that includes both Inuit and non-Inuit members. Uh, in particular, we're working with the Inuit regions of Nunatsiavut and Nunatubu. So uh, to provide some brief contextual background to this story, um, Inuit and caribou have shared a deep relationship for many generations. And so this animal is considered to be completely intertwined with many aspects of Inuit life and Inuit well-being, uh, including food security, livelihoods, cultural well-being, uh, mental health, spirituality, and many other types of connections. And Labrador is an interesting case for caribou because in the, oh, sorry, I don't know if my computer froze there. Um, but in the early 90s, the George River herd was considered to be one of the largest caribou herds in the world, uh, numbering somewhere around 800,000 animals. Just going to try playing that again. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, I guess the main point here is that uh, not too long ago, several decades ago, there were really a huge amount of caribou in this region. Uh, in fact, the George River herd was considered to be one of the largest caribou herds in the world at the time. But since then, this George River herd has been on a steady and rapid decline. Uh, the George River herd is now estimated to have declined by about 99% since about 2001, meaning that this herd is somewhere around 5,000 animals. Uh, there isn't any consensus on why this herd has declined uh, so dramatically, uh, but some of the overarching factors uh, are related to both natural and unnatural factors. But the main point here is that in a very short amount of time, there has been this extremely uh, large change in an ecosystem related to a species. And with this context in mind, the government of Newfoundland and Labrador enacted a total hunting ban on this George River herd in 2013. So that means that no one, not even Inuit, are allowed to hunt this animal anymore. So this combination of this dramatic change in a species population in combination with the hunting ban has resulted in uh, alteration to the way that Inuit are able to interact with this species and with the landscape that is uh, surrounded by both Inuit and caribou. And so the purpose of our project is to work in partnership with Inuit from these regions to uh, understand the ways that these uh, social and uh, ecological changes are affecting Inuit well-being and we're doing this all through documentary film. So before I get into some of the things that we actually found, I'd like to come back to the book for a moment and talk about a particular quote that resonated with me. So uh, this woman said, to care for the glacier, you have to see the glacier, you have to know the glacier like you know a friend. And to me, this was such an interesting way of communicating this human environment relationship because right away you, you understand that kind of intimacy behind this relationship on how this person felt with the glacier. And this also stood out to me because it sounded very familiar. This is a man uh, who is talking about his experience and his feelings towards caribou in the context of dramatic changes. It's just part of it's part of the people, and to lose that, it's like losing uh, a friend. I suppose or losing something that you you know you just you wonder someday will it ever come back. So I hope you were able to hear that. Um, pretty much, people from completely different parts of the world that are relating their experience and their relationship to a natural feature of an ecosystem to uh, a friend, to this friendship. And in my point of view, this is where you can start to understand how people can really um, feel embedded into the ways that they understand responsibilities to these natural uh, ecosystems, to these animals, to these glaciers, uh, and these responsibilities of care. Now, 
what are some of the implications of what this loss of care, but what this loss of a friend means? Um, well, there are a range of different socio well-being and cultural implications, uh, and I'm going to share a few of them with you today. Um, this man said that I feel less of an Inuit hunter than I ever did because of all these restrictions that's been placed onto me. And I think this shows how this alteration in caribou populations has led to an alteration in self-perception and the way that people see themselves as embedded within the landscape and see themselves as individuals. The loss of caribou and the loss of this friend has also become deeply emotional. Uh, this woman says that, I think it affects anyone emotionally and mentally in a sense too. Your whole lifestyle has changed, which highlights how the decline in caribou, the decline of a species, has also affected the emotional landscape that is completely intertwined with this species. And crucially, uh, the loss of caribou has meant that there are disruptions to the, to the connections between generations. Um, an entire generation of youth are growing up not knowing what caribou tastes like, not knowing what the cultural practices and values and customs are associated with this animal. And they're also not knowing about the knowledge of not only the animal, but the land, as caribou was a way for people to connect the land in different ways. And now they're not experiencing those kind of uh, shared experiences. And as an example of this disconnection, um, here is a photo of two Inuit youth looking at past caribou hunting trips with their father. And this uh, reminded me of a section in Caring for Glaciers as there was also a, a section that talked about uh, how youth were looking at photos of uh, their local glacier for the very first time. And so I think that this shows what kind of disconnection youth can have when they aren't gaining those lived experiences themselves. And when they aren't going through these lived experiences on a daily or a somewhat regular basis, then it's hard to develop those kind of identity and emotional attachments that their parents as well as their grandparents and everyone else before them had. And subsequent to this, it can be difficult to develop the deep empathy and love and friendships to these people and, or sorry, to these animals and places if, if they aren't living through these experiences themselves. So just to bring it back to this quote, uh, to call someone or something a friend, it suggests that there's this deep relationship that is probably sustained through engagement, through interaction, through memory. And if you can't see your friend, and if you don't know your friend, then how can you truly care for your friend? And better yet, how can you even call something a friend if you don't have a connection to it? So whether talking about the caribou declines in Labrador or the receding glaciers in Ladakh or any kind of other environmental changes going on right now, there are clear alterations to the human dimensions of well-being and life that are, uh, are, are following these ecological changes. And I think that uh, what this book does so well uh, and actually links with my own research is that it's not only important to understand how human culture and well-being and society is being affected by these changes, but it's, it's integral that we prioritize these connections so that future generations can continue to see these animals and these places as a friend, a friend that they know well and deeply and that they want to continue to support. So I hope that this brief uh, talk has provided just one example of how uh, Kareen's work really goes well beyond Ladakh and resonates with communities in different parts of the world including uh, communities here in Canada. Um, so thank you very much for the time and I look forward to, I guess, the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you. Been... Yeah, thanks, Karin. Uh, that was an absolutely fascinating uh, panel, four great uh, presentations. Um, two of them providing an excellent overview 
uh, actually a very in-depth overview of Karin's uh, book, Caring for Glaciers. I hope many of you are inspired to uh, borrow or buy a copy of Karin's book. Um, and then we have had uh, two excellent um, uh, presentations which actually relate uh, Karin's work to other parts uh, of the world. Um, and, and I kept thinking very often, especially when, when David was using the quote to illustrate some of his findings, that we live after all in such a small world, right? These connections are there and if we actually uh, try and make those connections. So we have about um, 18 minutes uh, left. What I want to first do is invite Karin, the author of the book, uh, to see if she has, uh, if she would like to share any thoughts, uh, if she would like to respond to some of the comments uh, that have been made by the four uh, panelists. Uh, so say about uh, four or five minutes, Karin. Yes, perfect. Thanks, Sharada. Um, well, I'm extremely grateful. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, these beautiful comments and all of the things that uh, you've pulled from the book to bring this into a very interesting con conversation. And I think like it's it's so great to see that we have like uh, uh, four panelists from like different disciplinary backgrounds, but we like it's we're able to like it's it's bringing like this very like lively conversation. Like there are so many points where things are converging. Um, I don't want to take too much time, um, but I want to say that my depth is now bigger than it was at the beginning of <laughs> the panel. I acknowledge that. Thank you. <laughs> um, but there is one thing that kept on animating um, my thoughts while um, everyone was uh, talking. So. Um, Sarah, you were uh, putting the material here and then you asked this question about how do we um, bring this into a conversation perhaps with what is going on now here in Canada. And I think um, this is an issue that has in different like ways uh, been uh, recurrent in many of the presentation here. Like it took the form of uh, conservation in, in Travis and David's presentation. Um, but it's also about like the relationship between, okay, the state and its people and what do we do with the land? And I think that, um, yes, Travis, you mentioned something about people in a panel thinking through conservation only in terms of, of biology and not in terms of the social science. Um, but it like, if we are thinking through all of these development projects and the way that people from are relating to the land, whether we are thinking through development or militarization, um, of course, we have to recognize that um, once you remove the way that people are relating to the land and then to all of these other beings, um, it becomes an issue. So instead of, um, I think, um, there is a certain discourse, as we all know, which is enveloping development and then uh, resource management. Uh, but too often still, after all of these writings and then people um, studying and fighting for that, um, we are forgetting, um, many are forgetting, I should perhaps say, the sort of underlying power relations which are at the core of, of all of these development intervention and how they are sort of conceptualized. Um, so preserving species, preserving landscape is also about preserving people and how people are sort of envisioned and conceptualized. So if you are doing programs that focus on uh, caribou conservation, the first question to ask is how like indigenous population in that land are relating to the animals. Um, it can take, uh, the way of reconfigurating the land for different state projects can take many forms development, military. Um, as I mentioned in my opening, I sometimes think of, of uh, the militarization of Ladakh as, as a form of slow violence because it's uh, slowly over the years um, sort of severing certain connections that people have with the animals and the land. Um, it's, I think all of this serves to um, say that, that Yes, like it's it's a real danger to severe these connections from the beginning. So then it should be at the core of, of any intention. Like it's not only preserving the land, preserving animal is not only about preserving um, 
these non-humans and then, but it's also about preserving human beings and then it often like is very central as well um, and although we are in this uh, uh turn when we are trying to focus uh um away a bit from anthropocentrism we should remember that that this is important as well i think um and this is those are some of the issues that are um raised with the notion of the uh I think uh, Tanya mentioned the charismatic notion of the Anthropocene, and we should be uh, careful of that. Um, and then I uh, maybe one last thing. I, I I felt it was Tanya in your introduction in the beginning when you mentioned that uh, the way of caring is is an idea that Ladaki had have that does not necessarily have to do with like um it's not framed within um the philosophy of of Donna Haraway and and Bruno Latour, I think it's very interesting because for me, this idea of caring for the land, although I read their work, this, this is what I often say to my students in my theory course, you don't want, you're not like going in the field to test a theory, but you want to be in, like theoretically informed to be like, uh, like to, to have this sense of awareness for what people are saying. And I think this is a really interesting thing. And, and, and I must say, like even myself, it took me sometimes to understand this notion of care that people were foregrounding because it was like very confusing in the beginning to have like um, comments about the changing environment that were framed within like historical uh, element. But it's it's again, it's very important how um, it says a lot about how sometimes we are not as human beings. Um, we're not like framing thing in, in direct causality all the time. And one last thing that I want to say, like with all of these interventions that we have with people from different parts of the world, there has always been this debate in anthropology, like between universalism and the local and the particular. And I think it's very interesting to see that how we have like these various connections and then to like they are, um, those are unresolved tension, but it's always very interesting to hear that. So thank you. And then I think now we can open um, the floor to questions. I yes. think, Sharon, uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Karin. Um, yes, now the floor is open for comments, questions. Please feel free to type your questions in the chat or if you would like to speak. Uh, Shirley, please, could you unmute everybody? Thank you. Okay, the floor is open for questions, comments. Who would like to go first? The question can be for Karin uh, or for the other panelists. Well, I will if uh, nobody's talking, uh, Karin. So, yes, please. Yeah. Karin. Uh, I'm uh, Philip Messi. I'm a medicine professor in anthropology at the uh, University of Prince Edward Island. And um, I have a question. I work in India as well, but I work in a very different uh, area, I work in the south, in urban context. Uh, there's something that Sarah Snederman uh, mentioned during her, uh, her comments that kind of caught my attention. And I was wondering, Karen, if you could say something about that. Uh, she uh, mentioned uh, this idea of the Ladakhi ethics of care that you describe in your book. And I was wondering if you, uh, if you see that kind of care uh, directed and oriented to the new infrastructure that are uh, building uh, in those areas. Uh, is this something that is just in relationship to Glacier, but it, or it's kind of developing uh, towards the new infrastructures? And by the way, just to mention, uh, 10, 12 uh, of the audience member right now are actually my students who are in a film methods class. Uh, they had a class on Wednesday on ethnographic writing, and so the book panel was just a great combination uh, between uh, our last class and today. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Should, should I reply? Yeah, I, I think we'll do this since it, perhaps instead of collecting questions, I think like uh, it's very interesting what you're asking, Philip, whether this ethics of care relates only like to uh, glaciers and animal does it relate to, to does it relate to the new infrastructure um i i i never uh sort of thought about these things in that way 
Um, I don't know why <laughs> that you're asking this, but I think this, this is very interesting because I now do research in Danska, which is uh, sometimes considered a part of Ladakh, but uh, it's, it's very difficult to reach Zanska. Like there's no, like it takes about two days by road through very, very difficult road. And then all of these roads are um, uh, like built to connect this, the small villages uh, to Padum, the center of Zanska. And as you're saying this, I, one thing which fascinates me like every year when I return is how people are stopping along the road to fix the road, like on their own, like to use, uh, uh, if they see that something is sort of falling apart and that, that it becomes very dangerous and difficult, people will stop and then they will um, work on the road to make it okay. And then how, um, yeah, I, I will think about this. I think it's a very, very interesting question. I don't, it, it would take more like a uh, conversation to think, like to see if this is the same sort of ethic of care, but there is certainly uh, something here. Thank you for that. Can I just add something? Thank you. I mean, Sorry. I think that's a wonderful way to phrase uh, that, that question. And it, it makes me think too um, about the people with whom I work in other parts of the region, Himalayan region, um, about that. And I mean, I do think that there are some ways in which um, that sense of the responsibility to repair, uh, which Karin was just kind of indicating, can be there in relation to some infrastructural entities, but it depends which ones they are and how they've been built and, and by whom, right? Um, but I was also going to say, I think there's a kind of competing ethics of care, which probably, which has a very different ideological underpinning from, um, from for instance, the Indian Border Roads Organization, uh, which builds all of these border roads and, you know, has these amazing signboards all across um, the Himalayan region where, of course, the acronym is BRO, B-R-O, uh, which is also kind of playing on this notion of like filial kinship or whatever, right, the state and the military as big brother, which is building the infrastructure, but that the building of the infrastructure itself is kind of promoted as an act of care by the state. So I think there's a very complex set of dynamics and that would be a wonderful question to consider further. I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, does any of the, uh, okay, Tanya, go ahead. Uh, since we're on this uh, theme of care, and uh, I was wondering actually if you could talk about a little bit more about the, you know, uh, the words uh, that are actually used to talk to, to talk to meant to, to convey care. Um, Cause I, I'm sort of, I'm actually quite interested in, um, uh, care myself because it's sort of used so often in conservation literature to talk about how people care for an animal. And I feel that sometimes we don't pay enough attention to what the words mean in the languages that we're working and what are the Whoops. Uh, and one of the things, for example, that I found I keep getting muted. <laughs> One of the things that um, I found just working in Ukrainian that is a Indo-European language is that there are like so many different words with so many different kind of um, sort of other semantic meanings that don't all map onto this English word care, uh, which has this Latin root. So I was actually gonna ask you, you sort of cite this uh, uh, word uh, for care less and so I was just wondering if you could talk about the, the kind of the meanings of the word or the, if there are more words than just that one that you cited to, to, to talk about this. So in other words, can you kind of pull apart that translation process uh, between the word, the language you're working in and this English word care that we kind of use as a concept? Thank you, Tanya, for this. Yeah, I think like there is many layers to that, that that care and careless. I mean, in Ladakhi, people will say like Sana Metkan, which is like there, there's no like, there's no sort of care. Like it's basically that Sana Metkan is like, there is nothing like that. But the way that they will use it is really, so if the people are talking about the way that the state is relating to Ladakhi in terms of development project, in terms of infrastructure building, in terms like people will often feel neglect. 
for instance, like if, if you're thinking of the internet connection in, in Zankar and Ladakh, like it's always like disconnecting. And then it, so the same, like two things, when people are like, if they are referring to that, they will use the same expression as them, how they are treating glaciers and, and, and non-human, which um, yeah, is interesting in a way. And then sometimes like if, I know that like careless, like when people, because I often like have conversation with people in English as well. And then they will say like, they will use the word careless as like very like interchangeably. And also like the other notion is, is I see that people when they are talking about themselves in relation to the state is that we are third class citizens. They will often say something like that, which is sort of sometimes uh, like parallels these notions of care um, um, when they are talking. So in this, um, they, they just, and it's also a very often like um, um, the type of wording which will be used to refer to the treatment by the Indian bureaucracy. They they're careless. They don't care. Like it's so it's it's in between something which is like which has a deep sort of root and connection, but it has become my understanding is that it has become like something more like almost like a like an expression like it's just like well we're just like third class citizen oh they are careless oh because they are careless when they're doing this and i feel like there is many of these uh expressions in and it would be like interesting to to study that a bit more that have like sort of religious roots uh, in Ladakhi that are like over time becoming expressions. So for instance, in Zanska where I I am working right now, like people Ladakhi of that area will say very often if, okay, so if there's a locust invasion and the crops are lost for that year, or if there is not enough snow and they cannot cultivate, they will say hafatama. Hafatama means like it's the end of an era, which is sort of, uh, if you're thinking in Buddhist time, it has some like relation, but the idea that it, it's, a, it's a local interpretation of that because it would not be like exactly like that. But Hafatama has like this deep, like religious, like roots, but it's employed like on, a, on an everyday life. Like what is happening? People are cooking these instant, instant noodles these days, like Hafatama. But it's the same thing for a locust invasion, like destroying the field for an entire season. So I think like, but this is an excellent question. There is something of like this um, deep philosophical notions and, and religious notions that are like coming into like the very like expressions and vernacular. I hope it answers a bit. On that note, I'm going to close this session. Thank you very much, Karin. Thank you very much, all our uh, panelists. Um, and I hope all of us feel inspired to pick up Karin's book and uh, read and engage in uh, ethnography. Uh, this is a great start to uh, Circle's uh, fall series of webinars. Our next uh, webinar is, um, is titled, is, is by uh, Dr. Hina uh, Mistry. Uh, who is uh, an equity, diversity, and inclusion training specialist at the Wilfrid Laurier University. It's titled The Repatriation Debate After the Abolition of Indenture. This will be on 7th October, Wednesday, 7th October at 11 a.m. Um, and you will receive an invitation. Uh, so if you're interested, please do register uh, for the session. Um, I also want to thank uh, Shirley our um, admin support and uh, Gihan, our tech support uh, for uh, a smooth uh, Zoom webinar session. Thank you very much and have a wonderful rest of the day.